Amen. All right, we're going to get started. Chapter 45 in Genesis. We're mo working right through there. Chapter 45 is where Joseph reveals identi his identity to his brothers and everyone. And Joseph then invites his family to, to come to Egypt and stay there. The story from the previous chapters is just moving on here. Joseph reveals himself to his brethren, and he identifies himself with them. And uh, so let's start in the first verse of the 45th chapter of Genesis. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, because every, uh, every man to go out from me, and there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. So Joseph, in other words, clears the room. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. This time Joseph could not get out of the room like he did was. We saw him previously when he went to his chambers to weep. And, uh, but he, couldn't, he just couldn't stand it. He loved his family. He wanted his family with him. And, uh, but no one really knows why Joseph wept. His own brethren at the time uh, uh, don't know and the servants there don't know there's no further reason for joseph to conceal his identity with everything that he's went through have you ever just wept be out of a release you have been through so much and uh, uh and you know what uh there's coming a day when the lord jesus through christ is going to make himself known to to all of his brethren and, and uh, uh, the jews and when he came the first time he came into his own and his own received him not but it'll be an emotional time then when they realize that he really is the Messiah. And, uh, uh, but when it comes the second time, he'll make himself known to his own people. In fact, Zechariah 13, 6, and says, And no one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So he'll pretty much, when Jesus returns, cut them to the quick, won't he? Christ will make himself known to his brethren. Zechariah 13, 1 says, In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. It'll be a family affair between the Lord Jesus and his brethren, the Jews, at that period of time. Uh, then it says, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? And, and the brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. Troubled in our translation is not really strong enough. The brothers were terrified at his presence. They remembered what they'd done. And uh, now they're terrified. Uh, it had been close to 25 years since they had uh, 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 seen him and they sold him into, to the Ish Ishmaelites. And so they're afraid. You know, when you've done somebody wrong and they reveal themselves and they've been kind to you, it's kind of a fearful thing, you know. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. I'm your brother. Man, that is a dramatic moment for all concerned. Can you imagine how they felt? Notice the reaction of Joseph here. He's not angry. He's not seeking revenge. That would be the normal human reaction. Then why doesn't he seek revenge? He says, now, in the fifth verse, Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Let me tell you, one of the big things is to understand that in the, some of the difficult situations we go through li in life, God will use it to his good and, uh, uh, and, and to the body of Christ's good. And, uh, you know, today we had lunch with, uh, Debbie and I had lunch with Mike and Pat Heiser. And we talked about the ministry in Kenya and, and just spent time with them. And, and uh, uh, in the midst of all that, we were talking about how God really works in different ways. We don't understand everything he does, but we know his purpose is always good. And then I was just sharing them with you. Sometimes when you have questions in your mind, remember, don't try to think it out. Because the real thing that you need to know is what does God want you to do? You can look at it pros and cons. I've had people over the years say, you know, in sales, they used to uh, have that clothes that you'd use. Well, here's, here's, here's the, the reasons. Give me the reasons you don't think that you should do this. They'll give you reasons. 
then you help them come up with the reasons that are a whole lot greater than why they should make that purchase. But when you're serving God, it's not a matter of pros and cons. It's really a matter of what does God want me to do? And I remember when, uh, uh, when my daughter Melissa and Chris came and he had a job offer and he was trying to think, well, if I take this job offer, he was one of the assistant coaches at Lee Summit High, and uh, uh, he said, if I take this job offer, I don't know if I have the freedom. Can do the I said, you're thinking about it too much. Don't try to think all the pros and cons. Let's just ask God, does he want you to take the offer? Because God knows the desires of your heart. He knows what you want to do in life. He knows what's important to you. And then he has a plan that he wants to. Uh, so what, what do you need to ask? God, what do you want me to do? And then if you do that, he'll, he'll handle the rest. He says, For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and that there are five years in, in which there shall neither be, uh, uh, neither, I can't hardly read this here, neither be uh, earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve your posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he has made me father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout the land of Egypt. How many times do you think it is in our own lives when we cannot see the hand of God in the situation that we're in? It just doesn't seem, well, how can God turn this for good? Man, God knew before the foundation of the earth what was going to happen with Joseph. He, he knew all of those kind of things. If you and I could see the hand of God on our lives, would we become angry? Would we seek revenge? I think many times we would if things didn't seem like they were working out right. Again, this man, though, he gives the glory to God. Joseph was 17 when he was brought into Egypt. He was 30 when he stood before Pharaoh. And there had been seven years of plenty, now there, there passed, and two years of famine. So Joseph has 39 years been living in the land of Egypt for 22 years, and he sees the hand of God in all this. He's telling them, you may have meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. Haste ye, he says, and go up to my father and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt, come down unto me, tarry not, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen. Anybody ever hear that term, land of Goshen? I mean, my mom used to say when she'd get frustrated, she'd say, well, land of Goshen. I wondered, well, what in the heck is a land of Goshen? But anyway, uh, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children and thy children's children and thy flocks and thy herds and, uh, and all that thou hast, and there will be, uh, and there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household and all thou hast come to poverty. So Jacob and his family could not have survived had they stayed in the land of Palestine at this particular time. They would have perished. And Joseph wants them to come down to Egypt to the land of Goshen, which is actually the best part of Egypt. You know, it's interesting when you go to the Middle East, you find out there are places that are just barren and other places that are quite fertile. Matter of fact, did you know that much of, much of Israel uh, is, was quite barren except for the places where the, where the Jews uh, farmed the land and, and brought out great crops? I remember when we stayed in the, uh, in the uh, Hotel D uh, King David, and I'd go down for the buffet, and I'd look down there. There was some meat and fish there, but for the most part, man, there was this long buffet of every kind of fruit and vegetable you could think. I was in heaven there. I like fruits and vegetables. It was pretty nice. Uh, and so it's in that land that God's called them. He's going to make them a nation, sheltered from the rest of the world. And the lives of the brothers revealed that they needed to get out of the land of Canaan. In the 12th verse, he says, And behold, thy eye, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that it is my mouth that speaketh unto you. In other words, he's saying, Look at me. I'm exactly who I say I am. I think they stood there absolutely spellbound and were down on their faces and then up again and they had absolutely nothing to say as they listened to Joseph speaking words that seemed unbelievable. Then he said, And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that ye've seen 
and ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. It's a tender scene. These two full brothers, Joseph and Benjamin, are both marvelous men. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after, after that, his brethren talked with him. The other brothers were stunned. But now they begin to recover their senses, and they have quite a talk, and the news begins to be spread uh, all around. And then in the 16th verse, And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come, and it pleased Pharaoh well, and his servants. You know, it probably doesn't upset Pharaoh at all. You know why? He took in one, of, uh, he took in Joseph. When he took in Joseph, everything in Pharaoh's hand prospered. To get his whole family in there had to be a good thing. So all this noise is about, uh, about the house of Joseph and the people could hear it. Pharaoh wanted to know what was going on. And I suppose he asked one of the servants from Joseph's house what it all meant. The servant probably said, well, you know those 11 men who came down from Canaan? They're Joseph's brothers. And it delighted Pharaoh. Why would it delight him? Pharaoh was probably a, a Hickos king of the same r racial strength as Joseph and his family. He hadn't been able to trust the Egyptians too much and was pleased with Joseph's faithfulness. So here he is, uh, really of the same type of, uh, of, uh, of family in relationship to Joseph. And, uh, and so he's thinking, man, it, it can't do anything but good to have them down here. Because he hadn't had any luck with the Egyptians. They couldn't interpret dreams. They couldn't do anything. But here's Joseph, man who's tied up with God. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye, laid your beasts, and go and get you into the land of Canaan. Take your father and your households, and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and ye shall eat the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, This do ye, take your wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father, and come. Pharaoh orders wagons to be sent. You know, the wheel was quite an invention, and these men from Canaan were not using wagons yet, but the Egyptians were more advanced. Remember, the Egyptians had chariots and everything else. They, they made use of the of wheel. And also, regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. What's he telling them? Man, you don't need to bring anything extra. You don't need to gather up stuff. I, I, anybody, how many people in here beside myself have made a big move in their life? And when you move all that stuff, you get there after a while and you go, why the heck did I bring it? Why did I keep it to begin with? When we moved into that house, I found so much stuff that I brought right back to Goodwill and to, I mean, right to over to Goodwill and a bunch of it to the dumpster. I don't know why we kept it. We hadn't used it in years. We like to gather stuff, don't we? Have you ever used the excuse, I gather stuff because you never know when you might need it? Well, yeah, well, most of the time you don't need it. So anyway, uh, uh, so he, but Pharaoh's telling them, you're not going to have to gather all your stuff together. We have more stuff here, than, and, and, and it's all yours if you come. You don't need to bring anything else. And the children of is Israel did so. And Joseph gave them uh, wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh and gave them provision for the way. Now we're going to do 21 through 26. Read that. To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And to his father he sent after his uh, manner ten asses laden with the good things of Egypt and ten she asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So he sent his brethren away and they departed. He said unto them, See that you fall not out by the way. And they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he's the governor over the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. He just couldn't believe this was true. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he'd said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, was revived. In other words, he was down. He about fainted when, he, when they tried to tell him about Joseph. He didn't really believe it. And then when he looked and see how Joseph had taken care of them, and uh, all that he heard all that they said, well, then his, spirit, his, his strength came back to him. Finally, old Jacob, Jacob was convinced. 
and he began to exhibit some enthusiasm. And Israel, or Jacob, said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive, and I'll go see him before I die. What was his attitude about all this? Man, he had spent all these years grieving over what he thought uh, had happened to Joseph, that Joseph had died, been torn up by wild animals. And uh, uh, so what thrilling developments are here? The prospect of seeing Joseph influenced Jacob to make the decision to go on down to jo Egypt. You think he intended to remain in Egypt? I don't think so. I think uh, he'd, he'd been living in Canaan for so long. I think all he wanted to do was see his son Joseph. I think he intended to have a brief visit with his son then return back home as soon as the famine was over. But he never returned to Canaan except for a burial, his own. He died in the land of Egypt, and although his whole family lived there, he was buried in the land of Canaan. Pretty simple chapter. We're going to get started on chapter 46. So we find here that Jacob in 46 and his family moved to Egypt. Jacob and Joseph are reunited, and uh, Jacob probably thought he was just going to go down until the famine was over, but I want to tell you, God had instructed Abraham to stay out of Egypt, and Abraham had been in trouble down there. God had said the same thing to Isaac. So now the question is, should Jacob go down to the land of Egypt? He needs a little bit more encouragement than the invitation from his son Joseph. He needs to have a green light from God. So 46.1 said, And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. Now that's an amazing thing. He offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. The first time he left that land, according to the land of Haran, he came to Bethel. Was he looking out, were looking for uh, God? No. He thought he'd run away from him. God got his attention at Bethel, didn't he? He wasn't seeking the mind of God, nor was he asking for his leading. What a contrast there is between young Jacob and the servant of Abraham. The servant of Abraham never took a step without looking to God. But Jacob didn't think that he needed God in his life at all. It took a long time for him to learn. Did, have you ever met people like that? It takes them so long. Did you know the chances of somebody accepting Christ after childhood get slimmer and slimmer and slimmer and slimmer? By the time a person reaches my age, 67, if they haven't accepted Christ, the chances of them doing that are very slim because we're most in, influenced when we're children. That's why I've said it's very important for us to give them the right idea about who God is and teach them about Jesus at an early age. There's a big contrast between young Jacob and this now, this older now who's the servant of Abraham. It took a long time for to learn that the proper way to go through life. And many Christmas Day go through the entire week and leave God pretty much out of their program, but they seem to make it to church on Sunday. They think if they've come to church on Sunday... They pay their tithe and listen to the sermon. They have taken care of their responsibility. But our relationship with God is so much more than a Sunday service. We're to be living for God all week long. You know, I love what Paul the Apostle said in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. He said, in him we live and move and have our being. God is everything. Amen? So what they do, many people, they, they, they tell God goodbye on Sunday night. Then they go back to living the life that they've been living the week before. For the man Jacob, for most of his life, he'd not been looking to God. But now as he comes to Beersheba, he offers sacrifices unto the God of the father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the, in the visions the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. And that's a whole sermon in itself. When God awakens you, talks to you, uh, when he brings you revelation in your life, the first thing you need to say is, here am I, God. What is it you desire of me? Here am I. And he said, here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I'll make thee, there, make there, make of thee a great nation. A great nation. He's promised them. You know, while they're in Egypt, even though they end up in slavery, can I tell you something? They become a massive nation there, a massive nation. 
And God's promising he'll make of Jacob a great nation. Maybe you're wondering if God did that. We find the answer in the next book of the Bible. And the, in Exodus 1, 7, it says, And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. I think the fact that the land was so filled with them, we'll, we'll discover in Exodus, was one of the things that made Pharaoh uh, afraid of them. And what's the explanation of that? God's making good his promise to Jacob. I am the God, God of thy father. Fear not, go down to Egypt, and I'll make of thee a great nation. And so in 46, 4 and 5, he says, I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee uh, up again, and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father and their little ones and their wives and the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. Pharaoh, you recall, had sent these wagons from Egypt. They put Jacob in one of the wagons, and off they go. The life of Jacob can really be separated into, into three geographical locations. The first one is the land of Haran. The second is the land of Canaan. And now, the land of Egypt. And I'm not going to spend a long time on that. But man, at the end of my life, I want them to be able to say, uh, pa uh, Pastor Bob Cap spent uh, time in one place, but God moved him until he brought him into the place they wanted him. And there he spent his life at Heart of God Fellowship. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, there's not only geographical areas, there's spiritual areas. Jacob left the land with just a staff. When he came to Haran, he was God's man living in the flesh. He came out of Haran running. He was running away from his father-in-law, was afraid to meet his own brother Esau. Then in the land of Canaan, Jacob had his wrestling match. But he is God's man who's fighting in his own strength. Now he's going to Egypt. He's not even walking in his own strength. He's not running anymore. He's now walking by faith to be carried in a wagon. Amen? Anybody else find life not only fun, but incredibly interesting? I think sometimes people miss all the mighty things that God does in their life. They get so wrapped up with the everyday mundane things, they don't understand that God is with us in the little things and in the big things. Amen? Joseph is prominent in this section of Genesis. Be sure to mark the evidence of the spiritual man of faith and the lack of a Jacob. Jacob has become a man that God wanted him to be, and it took him his whole life to get there. Now let me state this again. Jacob's life in Iran typifies the man who, uh, uh, man of God who's living in the flesh. Jacob's life in the land of Canaan typifies the man of God who's fighting in his own strength. Jacob's life in Egypt typifies the man of God who is walking by faith. It took him a long time to get there. Don't give up on people, you know. You may be thinking about them and saying, you know, they'd have so much better life if they just walked by faith. Can I tell you, it sometimes takes a long time for people to get where God can really use them. Get Jacob's life in Egypt, typifies a man walking by faith. And I believe that's true of many of us today. Time in our lives when we came in contact with the gospel word of God and we turned to him. There was that period of struggle when we thought we could live our lives in our own strength. And that may have lasted for years. But I tell you this right now, that if you're trying to think your way through life, if you're trying to live your life in your own strength, uh, you are pretty much destined to failure. But if you'll look to God and you'll trust in God and place your trust in God, not only in when everything's working out good, but when it looks like it's not working out good, God will bring you through it. And he exercises your faith in that very way. Perhaps it lasts for years when people are struggling in their own strength. Then there comes a time when we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we finally begin to walk in faith. And that's a beautiful walk when you come to the place you say, okay, so I finally admit it. I'm an idiot. I can't seem to work this thing out. But God, if I'm going to make it through it, 
It has to be a work that you're going to do in me. In 46, 6, and 7, And they took their cattle and their goods which they had gotten in the land of Canaan and came into Egypt. Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his seed brought he with them into Egypt. Because of the famine, Jacob had to take everyone. Nobody would have made it back in Canaan. There was no food. The following verses give the genealogy of Jacob. It's very interesting because it is the genealogy which lead to Jesus Christ and will be followed through the rest of the Bible. And all the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins besides Jacob's sons, wives, all the souls were threescore and six. Of course, Joseph and his family were already in Egypt. And the sons of Joseph, which were born in Egypt, were two souls. And all the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were threescore and ten. This brought the total household of Jacob to 70 souls. Notice each son of Jacob and his offspring were listed by name. Why are these lists of names given to us in Scripture? Doesn't God have something more important to give us than the list of names? There's nothing more important than our Lord Jesus, and he wants us to see the genealogy of what led to Jesus. We'll some find some of these names in the genealogy in the first chapter of Matthew and at the, be at the very beginning of the New Testament. Again, we'll find some of these names in the genealogy given in Luke. The list of names are important for that reason. There's another reason. It's very personal. Have you heard of the Lamb's Book of Life? The question is, is your name written there? Just as you got into the line of Adam and we all are in that line, you get into the line of Christ, and that is also by birth. In the case of the Lamb's Book of Life, you get there by the new birth, which comes by receiving Christ. When you do that, you become a child of God. How important are you? I don't know you. Probably have never heard of you. Some of the people watching on this li live thing right now, but God knows you better than anyone else knows you. He knows you and loves you more than your mother did. And I don't imagine she ever counted the hairs of your head, but God did. He knows every hair on your head. God knows you personally. In Jacob's genealogy, there are names that mean nothing to me. In watching the news, you see a crowd of people. Know this. God knows each one of those in that crowd. God loves each one in that crowd. We see a mass of people in a protest over the last few years. You see a mass of people inside of a stadium. You see a mass of people. I've been to many crusades in my life, gospel crusades. You see that mass of people. But God knows the number of hairs on every head. He knows everything about that individual. It's important to me to know that I'm just not a name, but I'm an individual that God knows and cares for. Now, a lot of the names are listed, and I'm not, I'm not interested in all of them, but God is. And he's delighted in putting their names down because they were his. And uh, in verse 28, and he said unto Judah, uh, uh, before him into Joseph to direct his face into Goshen, and they came to the land of Goshen. Now Jacob and Joseph are re reunited. And Joseph made his chariot, in verse 29, and Joseph made ready his chariot, and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen, and presented himself unto him, and he fell on his neck and wept on his neck for a good while. You know, Joseph is an emotional person, isn't he? Did you know what I like about it? I know that in the last days, if anybody are, f are pulled away by false prophets that the Bible says we'll have, it'll be people that are highly emotional and are not holding to the truth. Being emotional is one thing. But it doesn't work in, if you're not holding on to the truth. Because emotions can go anyway, and even the devil can ma manipulate emotions. But man, hold on to the truth. Hold on to the things that God said you. Uh, the Word of God says it was a good while that they held each other. The emotion was quite real. real. Uh, what a marvelous meeting that had to be. And Israel said unto Joseph, Now let me die, since I've seen thy face and because thou art yet alive. In other words, what a relief this was to Jacob to find out that his son was alive. 
And he, I believe he barely made this trip, but God sustained him. We find that he's permitted to live for another few years in the land of Egypt. Israel and Joseph had these last years together. Uh, my father was not a good father, but I will say this. I, uh, I'm so glad that he and I got restored before he passed and that he got a lot of things right with God at the same time. And uh, uh, because I think restoration is so important, folks. As far as Jacob was concerned, his brother, his son Joseph was dead. Now he finds out not only alive, but he's restored with him. That had to make his later years quite enjoyable, watching his family and getting to know his son. And Jacob, Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds, for their trade has have been to feed cattle, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all they have. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you, they shall say, What is your occupation? That ye shall say, Thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth even until now, both we and also our fathers, that, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Do you remember I taught that earlier in Genesis, where, uh, where nowadays we would think a shepherd is an honorable job, but, but to the Egyptians it wasn't. That was the lowest type of individual there could be, is to be a shepherd. Uh, they had the same problem in Egypt that, uh, in that day that, they had in the, that, that we have in the United States. Egyptians didn't care for shepherds. And uh, uh, there are a lot of people today that still believe that people that work in, in livestock and things are, are less than the person that's sitting in an office in, in downtown, and they're not. How many people are glad we have shepherds? And I'm glad of it. And uh, uh, I remember this kind of an off, offhand joke, but I remember watching this comedian. He said, I heard that the flatulence of cattle is one of the problems uh, with our ozone zone later. He said, I, he said don't, don't, don't laugh that away. What I'm doing to help remedy that, I'm eating as many of them as I possibly can. <laughs> well, these people were shepherds, raised their own sheep, and they still do in the land of Israel. Shepherd is the figure of speech which is used to describe our Lord. He's the good shepherd, gives his life for the sheep. He's the great shepherd of his sheep who watches over them today. He's the chief shepherd who is yet to appear. He calls himself the shepherd. He is an abomination to the world, and he's not received today. And I'm speaking of the real Jesus Christ. The... Uh, the absolute jokes I've heard on TV and everything else making fun of Christianity and people that serve Jesus, what an abomination. But I want to tell you, uh, the liberals may make fun of what we believe. I had saw somebody say on Facebook once, I don't understand you Christians. I don't know how you got on my Facebook page, but anyway, said, I don't understand you Christians. Want to wear crosses around your neck, a cross, was a was a a way to murder people why do you carry symbols of of a way of torture and murder the cross so i answered him back say well paul the apostle said if i glory in anything i'm going to glory in the cross of christ and sir that's why we wear them amen the jesus uh, that is spoken of there are people today that are call themselves Christians that are real liberal that do not believe in the virgin birth of Christ uh, they don't believe that Jesus is all that we say he is they believe that he was just a good man who taught people how to live but my Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords he was born of a virgin he lived a perfect life he healed many as, and did good works while he was here he was falsely accused and hung on a cross, rose on the third day, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? But the fact that he is a shepherd, he's the shepherd that the world doesn't like. When I hear a preacher get up and say, we need to win this world to Christ, I want to call him up and say, the Bible says you're never going to lead the world to Christ. We're doing the best we can, and Jesus came to die for this world, 
But I want to tell you, there are going to be a lot of people in hell. We need to do everything we possibly can to lead as many people to Christ as we can. The only one we have records of was a virgin born, performed miracles, died of the sins of the world, and arose bodily from the grave. That's the shepherd that the world doesn't like. He's still an abomination to the world, and shepherds were an abomination to the Egyptians. And Joseph tells his brother to tell Pharaoh that they are shepherds, and they raise cattle, actually bo both cattle and sheep. We find later that J Pharaoh will give them the land of Goshen, will ask them to take care of the sheep so that the children of Israel became the shepherds of the land of Egypt. Quite wonderful when you see how the family of Jacob is living in the land of Goshen. That is to be their home for a long time. I want to end by saying this. We are Christians. We are not in this, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. When you try to become like the world, you have to turn your back on what Christ said. Don't turn your back on the world uh, and don't turn your back on Christ. I will try to lead the world to Christ, but I'll always stay true to my Lord and Savior, no matter what the world says. And you're going to find that the children of Israel are going to become a great nation down there. And then we'll God, God will lead them out under Moses. And we're going to get into that next year. There's no record that God ever appeared to Joseph. Yet we certainly see the providence of God in his life. Man, let me tell you. The lesson to me this, this week is this right here. We are to be obedient to God's leading. We are to see God in some of the roughest things that we go through in life. And know that he'll lead us through it and lead us out to the other side. If anybody had wanted to judge Joseph while he was going through there, there's nobody that would have said Joseph is quite a uh, 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 successful person. No, they wouldn't have said that when he was in prison. They wouldn't have said that, but God was with him, and God blessed him everywhere he went. But what did we see about Joseph? He was a man of integrity, wasn't he? Let me tell you something. Serve the Lord. Serve him with gladness. Don't listen what this world says about him. He's our great shepherd, whether or not the world accepts him or not. Amen? And live a life of integrity. Do you receive that from the pastor tonight? Amen. Father, we just love you and we praise you. We love these stories that you've given us. They're not, they're not fairy tales. They're the truth. Genesis. This wonderful book, this book of beginnings, the beginnings of where we see the magnificent creation of God, the beginning of how sin tarnished God's creation, and how you raised up a nation in the midst of this, and out of that nation will come Jesus Christ. You had your hand in all of it, and I thank you and I praise you, and tonight we dedicate ourselves to placing our trust in you, Lord God, and not in this world. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hallelujah. I'm kind of glad we got back together. Now, I wanted to tell you, when we get, in, when we get into Exodus, uh, I'm not going to wear a robe and carry a staff. I'm not going to try to part the chairs with a staff. <laughs> Babe, we miss Brindley's birthday. So ask her right now what we could get Brindley.